Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I want to speak on, uh, on both the uh, omnibus appropriations bill to which we've just moved, as well as to return and make some comments on the health care legislation from which we uh, just retreated. Uh, first of all, with regard to the omnibus appropriations bill, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the fact that as my amendment or my motion is pending on the health care bill, dealing with one of the more important issues in the bill, namely the president's pledge to make sure that no one in America who makes less than $250,000 as a couple or $200,000 as an individual will be required to pay for the unbelievably high cost of this bill. And while we were facing that amendment, uh, the majority has decided that they will shift from the bill. I understand that's a tough vote to take because the bill contains so many hundreds of billions of dollars of new tax increases that the American people squarely in the middle class will be called upon, upon to share. But we should not have shifted from the health care debate to move to the omnibus appropriations bill, not only because of the importance of the issues we're dealing with on the health care legislation, but because of the omnibus appropriations bill itself. This Congress cannot control its appetite for spending. The appropriations bill, which we see before us now, is called an omnibus bill because it packages together seven of the individual appropriations bills that this Congress has been working on, which have, and we're still now just studying them to find out what the detail is, but from the information I've received, the average rate of growth in spending in this bill overall, over those seven bills, is somewhere between 12 and 14 percent growth in federal spending. This Congress has generated a $1.4 trillion deficit in less than 12 months. And now for next year, we want to see federal government grow by another 14 percent, 12 to 14 percent. And that doesn't count the new stimulus package spending that is being talked about, and it doesn't count the spending, the almost $2.5 trillion of new spending that's contemplated in the health care legislation and any number of other pieces of legislation that are waiting in the queue to come before the Congress. At some point, fiscal restraint has to return and come to Washington, D.C. We haven't seen it here for far too long. And Madam President, I know that it's very tempting to just say, hey, we can pile the debt on our children and our grandchildren and spend what we want to spend today. There are those who say that the only way we can have a strong economy is to spend ourselves into prosperity. And yet, it is not the government that creates jobs. It is the formation of capital, it is the investment by small businesses and entrepreneurs in new ideas and new products and the expansion of business in the United States that will allow us to sustain a strong, healthy growth in our economy. If we continue to rely on borrowing money from the future in order to spend ourselves into prosperity, we will continue to see our national debt mount to points where it cannot be sustained. We are already at a 12 trillion dollar national debt, a national debt that is projected to double over the next 10 years to 24 trillion dollars. And I object to moving off the health care bill where we had such critical uh, amendments and motions pending, and I object to moving to a bill that will now increase the growth of the federal government by 12 to 14 percent in the seven areas where it is focused. And let me shift for just a moment, Madam President, and talk for a bit more about the health care bill. The motion that I had brought, which is the pending motion before the Senate, or was before we shifted off the health care bill, was a simple motion that would have required the bill to be recommitted to the Finance Committee with instructions to the Finance Committee to take out those parts of the bill that impose a tax increase on people in the United States who earn less than $250,000 as a couple or $200,000 as individuals. Very straightforward, exactly what the President pledged on multiple occasions to the American people he would do. Yet we have shown that there are almost $500 billion of taxes in the first 10 years of this bill, and if you look at the real first 10 years after the spending is kicked in, the 2014 to 2023 time period, it's almost $1.2 trillion of new taxes, a huge portion of which fall on the middle class. And the response? The response has been, 
well, actually, this bill has a tax cut, is a, a net tax cut. How can that be? The only way it can be claimed to be a tax cut is if you take all the subsidies in this bill, about $400 billion worth of them, that are used to provide people at lower income categories who don't have adequate access to insurance with a subsidy toward the purchase of insurance. And if you call that a tax cut, it's actually in the bill called a renewable tax credit, even though $300 billion of the $400 billion goes to individuals who do not pay taxes, who do not have a tax liability, and is scored by the Congressional Budget Office as spending, not tax relief. And even if you were willing to count that money as tax relief, then you would have a situation in which 7% of the Americans would be receiving these government subsidies, while the remainder would be paying the price, paying the, the, the taxes. To put some numbers on that, out of 282 million Americans who have insurance in America today, or, or will have in 2019, only 19 million of them would receive this tax credit that is being talked about, and remember, the vast majority of them get what's called a tax credit, but is a government subsidy going to those who have not generated a tax liability. And 157 million of that 282 million would be people who get health insurance through their employer and will not be eligible for that health insurance. And after you do all the numbers, and just take out the taxpayers who make less than $250,000 per year couple or $200,000 as individuals, the bottom line is, after all of those who are subsidized are taken out, there are still 42 million Americans in the middle class, as defined by the president, who will pay hundreds of billions of dollars in taxes. My amendment would simply require that those taxes be taken out of the bill, that the president's pledge be honored in the bill, and that the bill then be made put into a posture to return to the floor for further debate. Now, Madam President, one other item I'd like to talk about. One of the things that is often said by the uh, opponents of my amendment is that this bill actually drives down the, the spending curve. Well, when they say that, I wonder what curve they're talking about. Are they talking about the size of government? No. The size of government under this bill goes up by $2.5 trillion. Are they talking about the cost of health care? No. The CBO study indicated very clearly that at best, Americans will not see the cost of their health care go down. And for those in the most needy categories, the 17% of Americans who are in the individual market, their health insurance will actually go up by 10 to 13%. Are they talking about the federal deficit? Actually, CBO says that the deficit will go down. That's not the size of the government, but that's the size of the debt or the spending each year. But how does it go down? It goes down only if you use the budget gimmicks that I'll outline in just a minute, or if you include all the taxes, the hundreds of billions of dollars of taxes that are in the bill, and if you count the Medicare cuts that are in the bill. You take out any one of those, the, the nearly $500 billion of Medicare cuts, the hundreds of nearly $500 billion of taxes, or the budget gimmicks, and this bill does not drive the deficit curve down. Now, what are the budget gimmicks? And I'll close with this, M Madam President. What are the budget gimmicks I'm talking about? There are a number of them. The biggest is that the proponents of the bill just don't count the first four years of spending. If you look at the 10-year spending cycle of, of the first 10 years of the first part of this bill, the taxes go into effect on the first day the bill is with law, on January 1st of next year. The spending doesn't start until the year 2014. So we have 10 years of taxes, 10 years of the Medicare cuts, and six years of the spending. And that's how they are able to say, well, it balances out. If they started the spending and the taxing on the same day and didn't give themselves a four-year run of tax collection until they start the actual implementation of the spending part of the bill, 
it would drive the deficit down also. So, Madam President, all we need to do in this Senate is slow down, refer the bill back to committee, have them fix the provisions on taxes, and then work on some of the common ground that we know we have that will help bend the spending curve down and will help improve the situation for Americans across this country who are calling for us to control the skyrocketing costs of health care. It's my hope that as the Senate goes through the next few weeks of debate on this legislation as well as the other legislation that we bring before us, that we'll remember our children and our grandchildren and all Americans today who are calling for the kind of true health care reform that will truly address the kind of fiscal responsibility and the kind of cost containment that we should be seeking in these chambers. And with that, I yield back my time.